yes, uh, welcome to uh, Teaching to Transgress, Pedagogies for Just and Sustainable Futures. Um, so we've got two speakers with us today. Unfortunately, our third speaker had to cancel due to an unforeseen illness. Um, she very uh, sends her, her best regards. She wishes she could, she could be here with us today. Uh, but nevertheless, we've got two fantastic speakers um, and uh, for uh, what I think will be um, very fruitful and very timely and important discussions. Um, so I think that in terms of sort of the format, what we're going to do is just going to have our two speakers um, 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 sort of produce their intervention give their give their talks and then we'll open up the floor afterwards to um, a q a um with the discussion uh, with with everybody else um so just without further ado um our our first speaker very delighted to have uh deanne bell with us today uh a fellow uh, uh ntu uh, uh sort of a person um and deanne is the founding director also of ntu's decolonial research collaborative as well so uh over to you deanne Thank you, Heather, and um, good to be here with everyone. I'm going to try high technology and share my slides. I'm wondering if folks can see the slides. I can't see you. <laughs> uh, no, not yet. Ah, let's do one more time. Perfect, I think. Let's see if that works now. Yes, excellent. Okay, all right. Um, thank you, Heather, for creating this opportunity for us to think through relationships between teaching and learning and the myriad crises we face. The earth crisis, to borrow from the reggae group, Steel Pulse's conceptualization, the austerity crisis that only the labor class bears, the racial crises, the ethnic crises, the gender and sex crises, and on and on. I have free, framed the ideas I brought this as pedagogies in crisis for two reasons. The first is to think through the role of teaching and learning in moments of social crisis. And in a second sense, because of the crises and opportunities brewing in critical pedagogy spaces in the corporatized university sector that I want to problematize. The ideas that I'm, um, I've brought are in dialogue with an ongoing project and paper I published titled Occupy the Classroom Radically, in which I'm analyzing from a decolonial perspective how Western epistemologies, uh, methodologies, ontologies, and ethics structure and inflict wounds on historically marginalized people in the Westernized university and how we can respond to these structures that wound. So I want to begin with pedagogies that stabilize the crises. And one of the westernized university structures that I think is directly linked to the endurance of social crises is what Africana philosopher Lewis R. Gordon calls disciplinary decadence. The walling off of knowledges from each other in separate disciplines. The disciplining of knowledge, if you will, that has the effect of ossifying what we know about the world in which we live. The reductionism that makes our understanding of complex social problems thin. I think siloing knowledge in disciplinary camps blocks teachers and students off from understanding the crises in their totality. To give you an example of what I mean by this, in the Westernized University, there's a history of investigating a social crisis right under its nose, the attainment or achievement gap, as it's called, a visible hierarchy of difference to borrow Nelson Maldonado Torres's concept, 
a visible hierarchy of difference between people produced as black and people produced as white. A gap that signifies who performs excellently in the colonial framework of knowledge. Because the westernized university believes that the scientific method, a key tool of reductionism, a way of quantifying things, is the best way to know something in meetings where the gap is being discussed, three quarters of the time is spent having a discussion about statistics and the measurement of the gap, but not the problem that the gap signifies. Because the problem is about how some human beings are cut out of or cut off from being able to succeed in a colonial institution. And because the Western A's university refuses to acknowledge that it itself is a problem and linchpin in the colonial project. Every year its management returns to this problem that it fails to address. And every year the academy returns to look at the problem through an epistemology and methodology that does not have the tools to see, much less diagnose the social crisis that exists in its very own house. The scientific method, the primary approach to answering questions, which is reified in multiple disciplines as the gold standard of research, functions therefore to stabilize the problems and social crises we are living through. Even though this example that I've just shared with you um, occurs in administrative and, and management contexts, the principle extends to the classroom. We are teaching methodologies and epistemologies that are incapable of addressing the crises that are made so by using the wrong paradigms of thought. When Paulo Freire developed pedagogies for the oppressed, he did not propose a new siloed discipline. He proposed a praxis, a way, a mode of seeing and understanding problems and crises. He suggested that we start by posing problems that we are living through and that we do this in community. Then we study what is known about the problems together in community. And he suggested that through dialogue, not discourse, which is different, through dialogue about the realities we live and armed with the illuminations of the theories and concepts that we study, we can move from problem posing toward problem solving. Freire proposed that the purpose of critical pedagogy in adult education is to address world crises on local levels. One of the impediments I see in using critical pedagogy to support students and ourselves being able to contribute to solving social crises is that many of us, perhaps most of us who teach in the westernized university system have been disciplined in our own education. And we may not know much about the crises that many of our students face. I hear this from colleagues. All, a lot of the time. And this terrifies and paralyzes us, ensuring that we further contribute to the stabilization of crises by remaining in disciplinary mode. And this is made worse by the westernized university system, which pays lip service to supporting faculty learning about critical pedagogies, which is why Heather's intervention is, is so timely and significant. So stabilizing knowledge and method in epistemologies and methodologies that are incapable 
of analyzing the totality of our crises ensures that the crises themselves remain ossified. So that's the first um, thought about pedagogies in crisis. But moving to a second crisis, which has to do with pedagogy, again, structurally, which arises on cultural and ontological levels in the academy. The cultural theorist Sylvia Winter and decolonialist Sylvia Winter tells us, and I quote, Europe's most powerful apparatus is the education system. It initiates us into a culture and knowledge system that instructs us to want to be a specific ethnoclass of humanity, end quote. For those of us who know Winter's work, we know that the specific ethnoclass of humanity she's referring to is what she calls man. And she distinguishes this concept of man from the idea of the human. For Winter, man is a colonial construction, an ideal westernized subject who identifies as hypercognitive, racialized, bourgeois type of person. I'm calling the cultural and westernized subject a problem in the teaching and learning encounter because the culture and subjectivity that Winter speaks about shows, shows up in the classroom between people, so between students and teachers. And it blocks possibilities for addressing the crisis or crises rather. For some of us who are teachers, this imperial culture reproduces the race, gender, ethnicity crisis in the room itself. So a black woman from the global South has fewer degrees of freedom to support students in developing their political agency, an idea that Heather invited us to think about, because for some students, such a human is understood to have little, if anything, to offer pedagogically. This is not only personal lived experience I'm speaking from, but is increasingly showing up in the literature as a few more historically marginalized people are hired as faculty in the academy. So a third way in which pedagogies can be in crisis or part of the crisis itself is related to the first way on disciplinary decadence. But I want to address it from a slightly different angle. The sociologist Nasser Mir at University of Edinburgh in his most recent book, The Cruel Optimism of Racism, of Racial Justice, sorry, argues that racism cannot be understood in and of itself. In the case of racism, we need to see, and here I'm quoting Nasser, the affective, social, and political, end quote, dimensions of struggle, because these dimensions sustain and maintain the crises. They are part of the crisis of racism itself. I see Nasser's argument as relevant not only to racism, but extending to other ideologies that undergird and underwrite world crises. Nasser's argument further supports the imperative for classrooms to be occupied transdisciplinarily with problems to be solved, not disciplines to be reified and transmitted to students. So on the moving to the fourth and, and final point on questions of power and questions of struggle. Let us imagine that there are teachers and students who come together to teach and learn from each other 
and from critical theories, concepts, and methodologies that can help them understand the multitude of social crises we live with every day. And let us Im also imagine that together, these people who occupy the classroom radically invent solutions to the crises they know. Once they try to implement the solutions they have thought through, they will undoubtedly run into the roadblock of a lack of power, social power, and or a lack of resources. So financial resources, material resources, social resources, affective resources, time as a significant resource, and crucially, something that we don't speak about enough, collective critical consciousness. So resources which are necessary in order to move toward solving crises. This then brings us to a confrontation with our own agency. I believe we have further to go to understand how to build power and gather resources outside of the framework of coloniality, which will never volunteer to share social power with historically marginalized people. Critical pedagogies intent on contributing to solving world crises need to grapple with questions of power and questions of how to sustain the struggles beyond the classroom. I believe we need to build a larger and longer vision that connects radically occupied classrooms in the westernized university with communities and social movements outside of the university structure. If contributing to solving world crises is our aim. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for that uh, intervention, Deanne. Um, and just, I love this idea of, of the, the, you know, the phrase occupying the cl classroom radically and, and how we can begin to um, nurture this collective and critical consciousness. I mean, uh, so much to unpack there, um, and which we will get to in a moment. Uh, but before we do, um, our, our next speaker, I'm very, uh, very excited to introduce my my dear colleague and friend, uh, Darren Webb, who's a fellow utopian scholar and who's done fantastic work on um, utopian pedagogies of hope. Um, and yes, um, over to you, Darren. <laughs> Thank you, Heather. Um, thanks, everyone. I've had some bad experiences of technology on Zoom, so I haven't prepared any slides, which means I'm afraid you're going to have to tolerate my face for the next um, 20 minutes. Um, I hope you all survive. Um, but thanks, Heather, for inviting me to, to talk at this session. As Heather mentioned, um, Heather and myself know each other from meetings and gatherings um, in the small but sometimes wonderful world of utopian studies. Um, and I was asked to say something here about utopian pedagogy, um, which is a notion that I've been wrestling with for a few years now. And the term utopian pedagogy was coined in 1970 by Paolo Freire in Cultural Action for Freedom. And the central thrust of utopian pedagogy is to draw out and foreground the explicitly utopian dimensions of Freire's own critical pedagogy. For me, utopia denotes both a mode of imminent praxis and a collectively elaborated guiding vision, each feeding off each other and reinforcing the other in an iterative process. And pedagogically, this operates at two levels. The first is prefigurative, a kind of here and now utopianism in which classroom life embodies in its own practices, the forms of social relations, decision-making, culture and human experience that are the ultimate goal. The second involves connecting work within educational institutions to broader social and political struggles outside, just as um, Diane rightly highlighted. Helping to forge through a bottom-up process of collaborative dialogue, a vision of living, being and doing otherwise. And the experience of participating in this will then help inform and guide classroom practice in an ongoing positive feedback loop. Now, before I go any further, I think it's important when reflecting on questions of utopian pedagogy and utopian practice, on questions of what it means to be and to act as a utopian, to start with an honest assessment of one's social, economic and historical context. 
And for me, reflecting on the context right now, right here, I have to ask myself, is it delusional to approach education or at least the possibilities within formal educational structures and systems from a utopian perspective? So the blurb for this session draws attention to multiple intersecting crises and asks how we as educators can work with students in ways that nurture political agency and the desire for sustainable alternatives. What it doesn't mention are the utterly abject conditions within which we as contemporary educators operate. And I think these are important to acknowledge. The term dystopian schools is a common phrase used to describe the sphere of compulsory education. The term dystopian youth has been used to describe the cultural landscape young people inhabit. And when it comes to the academy, a whole field of critical university studies has emerged within, what, within which one finds analyses of the neoliberal takeover of higher education, the military industrial academic com uh, complex, the toxic university, the zombie university, the imperial university, and the neoliberal imperial institutionally racist university. Now, given the darkness of the contemporary juncture, can we talk about utopianism without sounding utterly ridiculous? Can we talk about the education of desire and liberating the imagination without sounding like the worst kind of abstract utopians, drifting into fancy in order to escape the bleak realities of our situation? And I waver in my answer to this. Now, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to read you two paragraphs I've written just to gauge your reaction as to whether you consider them ridiculous. Uh, and I'm being serious here. The following two paragraphs appeared in a journal article I wrote about utopian pedagogy. And sometimes I wonder if they sound unhinged. So here goes. Utopian pedagogy is a counter hegemonic project that strives to shatter contemporary common sense and challenge the ideology of there is no alternative. It's concerned with creating spaces for the exploration of desires, longings and hopes and for drawing out utopian possibilities within concrete experience. It's a pedagogy of transformative hope, a pedagogy aimed at liberating the imagination as to the possibilities for systemic change. Utopian pedagogy is underpinned by a profound confidence in the capacity of human beings to construct, both imaginatively and materially, new ways of organising life. It seeks to cultivate an awareness that human beings are self-organising and self-determining historical agents and a confident belief in the transformative power of collective action. The education and re-education of desire is one of the fundamental aims of utopian pedagogy. Some of the seminal texts in the field define utopia in terms of desire, the desire for a better life or the desire for a better way of being. And the role of utopian pedagogy is to teach desire to desire, to desire better, to desire more, and above all, to desire in a better way. To borrow Miguel Abinser's famous characterization of William Morris's project, so we're talking here about the formation of utopian subjectivities, not content merely with stimulating the desire for a new society. Utopian pedagogy, utopia as a pedagogical project, is concerned with developing subjects equipped to create and inhabit this new world. The overall aim is nothing less than human emancipation through a transformation in the ways in which subjectivities are created and desires are produced. Okay. So the formation of utopian subjectivities is a pedagogical project. I mean, does that sound ridiculous? Does it sound fanciful? Um, I don't know, sometimes I think it does. And until this morning, I was gonna continue here for another 10 minutes, outlining why utopian pedagogy in the contemporary academy is indeed fanciful. And you'd have been subjected to a depressing barrage of thoughts and reflections on the narrowing of possibilities and the closing down of spaces for pedagogical experimentation a catalogue of reasons why it's impossible to be a free Aryan critical or utopian pedagogue in the factory production conditions of the corporate imperial university. But then I changed my mind. <laughs> and as I said earlier, my views on this do waver. Um, although my views don't waver on this one claim, actually, that was going to be part of what I was going to say, that the real work of utopian pedagogy takes place outside the classroom and beyond the university. But anyway, instead of all that, what I'm going to do is talk about a project I was involved in um, as a means of illustrating what I see to be a key element of any kind of utopian pedagogy and what's sometimes referred to as educational archaeology. So I'm going to move from the very general and abstract, which is those two paragraphs I just read, 
to the very local and specific, I mean, one um, particular experience of mine. Okay, so that notion of educational archaeology, um, what do I mean by that? Well, educational archaeology is a project variously described as excavating, mining, uncovering, revealing, unearthing, tapping, hidden, submerged, repressed, suppressed, buried, subjugated, desires, longings, memories, histories, knowledges, dreams, possibilities. Now, in a classic statement of this kind, Henry Giroux and Peter McLaren talk of the need, quote, to tap the hidden utopian desire found in students' experiences, to uncover the submerged longings inherent within social and cultural practices, to engage in the task of excavating historical consciousness and repressed knowledge, and to commit to the project of redirecting the paths of human desire. Sounds fantastic, doesn't it? But how on earth do you actually go about doing that? How do you tap hidden utopian desire? How do you uncover submerged longings? How do you excavate repressed knowledges? And how does one harness those things to a project of redirecting the paths of human desire? How might we as educators dig through students' wants, desires, feelings, likes, longings and yearnings, and even recognize those hidden utopian ones which need nurturing and feeding? Now I cannot, in all honesty, say that my everyday practice offers up endless pearls of wisdom on this. Um, it certainly does not. However, I'm going to talk about one particular pedagogical experience I had, which illustrates both the difficulties, but also the possibility of educational archaeology and utopian pedagogy. Now, the project that I was involved in within the university actually involved working with secondary school pupils rather than university students, but it did engage with notions of sustainable futures, and the general points are relevant to, um, to university education um, as, as well as um, secondary education. So please do bear with me. Okay, so I was involved in a university-led project and part of this project involved me convening a day-long workshop with a group of 30, 13 to 15 year olds. And the workshop was called, How Utopian Ideas Can Help Us Think Creatively About the Future. And the workshop had to be linked in some way to the English national curriculum. And I tried to tie mine to the geography GCSE curriculum. And there were four sessions across the day I spent the first session talking about the concept of utopia, the history of utopian ideas and the functions of utopia. And here I emphasise the ways in which utopian visions can help liberate the imagination, how they enable us to envisage in general structure, but also in detail, a different way of life. And how, by depicting entire alternative functioning societies, they make us realise that other ways of living are possible. Now, this isn't something the national curriculum in England does. And I illustrated this with reference to climate change, where the geography curriculum focuses on mitigation and adaptation, alternative energy production, carbon capture, tree planting, changing agricultural systems, managing the water supply, all of which promotes the notion that sustainability is possible within society as it's currently structured. All we need is more energy efficient buildings, open spaces, solar panels, green roofs, etc. I pointed to the fact that when it comes to exploring the human causes of the climate crisis, one word missing from the geography textbooks is capitalism. And I tried to explain how the logic of capital is fundamentally at odds with the goal of sustainability. And I then highlighted two things. Firstly, that utopian texts are powerful mechanisms for conveying the effects of the climate crisis. While the geography textbooks might have a map or a diagram pointing to rising sea levels, flood risks, drought, dwindling crop yields and declining white wildlife, the utopian imagination explores what life would feel like under these conditions. Paints with words a talking picture of how we might live. Secondly, that the utopian imagination enables us to pose a question of fundamental importance, namely, what would a sustainable global alternative to environmentally catastrophic capitalism look like? Now, what I really want to focus on is the rest of the day where I introduce students to Charles Fourier, an early 19th century utopian socialist. And I use this as an opportunity to talk about the industrial revolution, mass movements of people from the countryside to the city, birth and growth of factory production and so on. Now I'm not gonna go into detail here, but I gave a very basic overview of Fourier's critique of the nature of work in the new industrial world, an overview of his notion of attractive labor, together with examples of Fourier's depiction of a day in the life of utopians, 
what a day in the life in utopia would look like for different individuals with different interests. And a key thing I emphasised here was the abolition of the division of labour. People would no longer be tied to one job, one area of work, were no longer deadened by doing the same thing day in, day out. And then the task I gave the students to work on in the afternoon, both individually and in groups, was to imagine what their days might look like in utopia. And while Fourier focused on work, I asked the students to focus on education. And while Fourier developed the notion of attractive labour, I asked the students to think about what attractive learning might look like. And just as Fourier listed all the things wrong with work, I asked them to list all the things wrong with school. And just as Fourier drew up visions of what attractive labour might entail for different individuals, I wanted them to draw up visions of what attractive learning might look and feel like for them. How to combine learning and pleasure in a utopian vision of alternative education. Now, I genuinely didn't know what to expect from this. In fact, I expected the unexpected. I expected to be surprised by the ideas and possibilities that would emerge from this exercise, from asking 30 teenagers to reimagine and reconstitute their lives. But what actually emerged from the exercise, it seemed, was a reproduction of education as it currently is. Incredibly, not a single one of the 30 could imagine learning taking place without the institution of the school. Not a single provocative suggestion that we should abolish schools. And the students found it equally difficult to imagine the dissolution of the division between school and leisure. In their utopias, there would still be a separation between time spent in school learning and time outside school engaged in, in leisure. Within the school day, there might be less time spent on maths. Beyond the school um, day, more time is spent gaming. But what emerged seemed like a confirmation of capitalist realism. And my initial response was dismay. I read this as a clear example of the stunting of the utopian imagination, of the narrowing of the bounds of possibility, of the embodied affirmation that there is, in fact, no alternative. But on reflection, I'd really missed a trick. And it was only after the day had ended, in fact, weeks and months after it had ended, that I realised that there was one demand running through the students' responses in which latent utopian possibility could be found, which contained seeds of utopian hope. And that was the call for having a lie-in. The call for a later start to the school day so that students could have a lie-in. Lying in is a utopian demand. Now, if I'd been quick enough, I'd have realised that lying in can be linked to both a rich utopian history and to key issues within contemporary human geography. If I'd had more time to spend with the year nines and year tens, this is what I wish I'd done. I'd have used the call for a lie-in as a springboard, a starting point for utopian exploration. I'd have introduced them to the Paul Lafargue's the right to be lazy, celebrating the possibilities opened up when one refuses work and the constraints placed on human creativity by institutions such as the school. And I'd have linked this notion of refusal to contemporary discussions about automations and the possibility of a post-work future. How will this affect, upset, render obsolete what's been taught in textbooks for years about industrial location and the geography of employment? What will the likely geography of a post-work society look like? There was scope here, I think, for working within the curriculum, focusing on urbanisation or the post-industrial economy, for example, but moving against and beyond this towards thinking about a post-capitalist post-work society. How might a post-work society impact on urbanisation? Might it facilitate a reversal of rural urban migration? Would this be a good thing? How might a post-work society help promote sustainability? What might, what might a post-work sustainable city look like? And here, in questions such as this, I'd have emphasised something really important. I'd have emphasised that the future is not given, its shape is not predetermined. The future is not a thing already known into which children and young people need to be shaped to fit in. The future is an unknown, the shape of which will be determined by the actions taken now by those who will inhabit it. Human beings are not automatons, cogs to be fitted into a wheel that just keeps turning and turning. Human beings are self-organising and self-determining historical agents with the capacity to construct new ways of organising life. So I'd have used this opportunity then to try to cultivate amongst the students what I've termed in my research transformative hope. Now the process I've described here Identifying a trace or spark of hope in something as small as wanting a lie-in and building on this, expanding its stretch so that it reaches out and touches questions of economic geography and geopolitics, 
culminating in appeals to the transformative powers of collective action. This is what I refer to as educational archaeology, the process of unearthing a desire, the desire to have a lie in, and seeking to tap the latent and transformative utopian possibilities within it. Now, returning to the final question posed by the blurb for this session, how might we nurture students' sense of political agency and desire to forge sustainable multi-species and just societies? I suppose one response would be to highlight the affective power of utopias. As Raymond Williams stressed, in the best examples of the utopian genre, one finds the discovery of a structure of feeling, which is in its turn a form of recognition. And I love this as a way of capturing utopian affect. In reading utopian literature, you enter different worlds and envisage, but also feel different ways of being. This new structure of feeling isn't completely alien though, because utopias are always grounded in and connected to the real. So the structure of feeling is also experienced as a form of recognition, a recognition of how things could be, a recognition that the present is incomplete, a recognition that something's missing in the here and now. But this isn't always and necessarily how students respond to utopian texts. And a module offering students various utopian visions of sustainable multi-species societies isn't necessarily going to inspire a desire to work for such. Utopian pedagogy isn't at all the same thing as a curriculum centered around utopias. And in fact, one thing I learned from my own experience was that I was trying to force the issue from the top down rather than letting latent utopian desires emerge from the bottom up. And this of course highlights the significance of time, the time and space required for considered reflection, the time and presence required for relationship building, the kind of time we don't always have with students. But it always ha also highlights something else which I think is important, which is to avoid becoming despondent if students' responses differ from your own idealized expectations. In my own case, I was looking for the obvious, in inviting students to imaginatively reconstitute their lives, to co-construct a utopian future for themselves. I was anticipating some in-your-face demands to tear this whole shit down. When actually, in fact, and this is my closing remark, utopian traces often lie hidden within and amongst the quotidian. Thank you so much, um, Darren, for that uh, fantastic reminder of the um, uh, liberatory potential of utopian visions, which um, kind of like Deanne's uh, sort of point about the sort of the project of decolonizing minds, um, importantly can kind of shatter the perceived immutability of the present. It kind of reminds that, you know, that kind of to quote Rebecca Solnit, you know, the, the better, a better future is always possible, but it's never guaranteed. So it, it depends on, on collective action yesterday, let alone today um, and in the coming days. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, just fantastic food for thought, and I really think you know the interventions fit so nicely together. Um, so, it, so just to kind of uh, to point out that the for some reason the chat function uh, isn't available. So, if anybody has any comments or questions or anything um, for our speakers, um, just uh, either use the raise hand function or uh, or unmute yourself, um, and we can go from there. Um, but yeah, I think otherwise we've got plenty of time uh, for for discussion. Uh, yes, Mark, go ahead. Oh, hi, folks. Thank you so much. Just, I have just loved the last, what was it? It doesn't seem like 45 minutes, was it? It's flown past. Um, so to let you know who I am, I, I teach a lecture in community education um, at the University of West of Scotland here in, in, in Lanarkshire in Scotland. And this morning I was doing a class about community development, and uh, all the, all the issues that you've raised today are so relevant. I think in in terms of the rethinking, the reimagining of um, the roles of a education, and I particularly like the idea of you know seeing education out with the context of the school, because uh, I don't know how much you know about Scottish education, but obviously. The kind of field I work in, it's like youth workers, community development, adult learning, that kind of area, which has all been radically hit by the neoliberal um, context within. within. So, so, so my question is, um, 
it, it, it feels to me I'm involved in a lot of things out with the, the school environment. I'm part of a, a collective called the SEEN Collective called Solidarity Against Neoliberal Extremism. And we're, we've been involved in like radical municipalism in, at Glasgow level, um, critiquing the current system, but also using this kind of concept of social imagination, utopian imagination to, to work in communities, um, to, to create those spaces for, for the kind of thought that we're talking about. So I, I'm very interested because they are, uh, that's the only thing that you know keeps me going. Basically, <laughs> is the kind of thinking that, like Diane and Darren and Heather, obviously you are deeply involved in. But what frustrates me is that uh, this desire to react against the the disciplinary kind of boundaries, the um, individualization, the the competition of the ref, and all these kind of things. This our our, our ability to prefigure. A different way of being ourselves, you know. Because I, I mean, I don't essentially see myself as an academic. I see myself as an activist who works, <laughs> who's paid by by a university. Um, but our ability to work collectively to create those spaces. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with um, a, a collective called a. Uh, Jesus, when things go right out of your head when you need them. Um, it's, it's gesturing towards decolonial futures. Um, so the work of Vanessa Androti and, you know, that that, that collective is something which I, my, my, the hairs on my arm are standing as I, as I speak. It's just that kind of sense of feeling, that kind of sense of rejecting the colonial concepts of of rationality and you know the the cognitive dominance etc. So I was at a event. I'm going to shut up in a minute, honestly, but it's a long question. Um, I was at an event on Friday night, which was about called um, decolonialized now um, by the New Internationalist, which I don't know if you're familiar with that with that um, publication. But Professor Tommy Curry from Edinburgh University was there talking, um, and. He was quite depressed about the role of education and actually being able to, you know, to bring about decolonial kind of futures. Uh, and so I'm interested in the the speakers and, and yourself, Heather's your perspectives on um, if if it's not education, how can it be? You know, his his depression was that. Capitalism constantly refines itself. Colonialism refines itself. It, it invites people in and talks about diversity and uses all these language to simply sustain the current system. So I am looking for those spaces that are, as Darren put it, tearing the whole fucking thing down, um, <laughs> um, but also building a, you know, building something. And you know, um, I think there's a. You know, there's, there's there's lots of good examples of building the, the new future in in the present. So this this is what I'm really interested in, and I'm and I'm really really keen that we, well, if if it's possible to stay in touch with these conversations, because these are the spaces, these are the conversations that I think are the most crucial, and are you know how many of us are here, fifty or something like that. You know, we need to really break these out and make them much more accessible to to not just students but communities to colleagues etc so thank you so so much thank you so much for that um for that mark um solidarity and and absolutely but um do our speakers have any any responses <laughs> yeah sure I'm, I'm happy to respond to that um Thank you for that, Mark. Um, it was interesting to hear you describe yourself really as an activist working within a university. Um, and I think that's a really nice way of, of phrasing um, how I actually see the uh, kind of utopian pedagogy. Quite a lot of what I write about is actually, um, you know, a kind of depressing expressions of, <laughs> of, 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 of the, the narrowed, constrained possibilities that are actually um, possible within um, formal education. And I've kind of described those kind of spaces, those, those kind of spaces that you can create, because, you know, 
we can't we mustn't we must avoid risking kind of over determining the university as this kind of homogenous oppressive closed um, entity there are spaces that can be created for experimentation for other doing however the reality is those spaces are often transient they're often fleeting they're often small scale um, and i've described them myself in my own research as kind of bolt holes and breathing spaces they're not transformative spaces those spaces are actually spaces that we return to um, or kind of take refuge in or almost kind of gain strength to do the real work which i see as kind of lying outside formal educational institutions so there's like a massive scholarship or a massive um um yeah scholarship on the notion of the scholar activist or the activist scholar um and i you know i kind of agree a lot with what um remy joseph salisbury and laura connolly write in the anti-racist activist um scholar activism that the best we can do or the utopian work of the academic is to take the skills and privileges and resources that we've developed and got access to and actually you know give those as gifts to organizations and communities um, and stuff working outside the institution. Um, Fred Moten and, and Stefano Harney in the Undercommons talk about, um, you know, the only authentic relationship that you can have to the university is, is one of theft. You know, you steal what you can in order to give um, to others. So I actually also see myself more as that kind of activist working within a university. And I spend quite a lot of my time outside university working with um, community organisations and activists and campaigners on various projects that have all been very short lived and transient themselves, but trying to build what I see as a grassroots utopia. So I kind of work in the field of utopianism and kind of research utopianism, but utopianism as a genre tends to be quite an individualistic bourgeois genre. It tends to be individuals who've either written texts or created movements. And um, those individuals have kind of, you know, all sorts of privileges and, and the visions often reflect that. Whereas I've kind of committed to the project of building a grassroots utopia. And so, so I kind of spend a lot of my time outside in, in short lived, often aborted, you, you might call them failed, but you know, fa you know, you try, fail, try again, fail better. You know, that kind of old cliche. So I, I completely understand where you're coming from. Um, so I'll just I'll just leave it there. I'm sure Diane's got something to say as well. Mark, thank you for um, all that you said and for the question, um, if it's not education, what can it be? And as you were talking, I was um, going back to um, a Boston Review piece that Robin D.G. Kelly published called Black Study, Black Struggle, in which he acknowledged the utter pain and devastation that particularly Black students in U.S. higher education experience within the structure of the academy, and argued that rather than positioning themselves as victims of a system along the lines of what Darren was saying, what can you take from the system? Meaning um, if you come into the institution, they're very minuscule, slim spaces for you to study something that's relevant to your life for the reasons that I was talking about the scientific method and the basic approaches. But that the idea of struggle is something that even though many places and spaces within the university don't teach it or engage with it, we can somehow help to inculcate that in students. And that as an adult, learning that this world, as again, Darren was pointing to, we're not fated to the same future that we're currently living. And so the idea of struggle is something that I think we don't pay enough attention to. It's, it's almost as if let's transfer knowledge, different knowledge, new knowledge, decolonial knowledge. I say, no, that's not enough. Epistemology is not sufficient. Understanding the problems with methodology is not sufficient. There is an ontology of struggle that we need to face up to. And so that's what um, part of what was going through my head as you were talking. And then the other aspect of it is I can't give up 
what I know about how historically marginalized people are dehumanized in the what I call plantation university. I, I can't give up that struggle. It's it's not a struggle that I will live to see become its utopian version, but I know that struggle as a student. I know that struggle as an academic. Um, and I see it with other human beings in a myriad of the ideologies that create those problems, racism, ethnicism, evilism, ageism, the list goes on. So I can't turn a blind eye to the actual violence that's being done to human beings inside the academy. So I see we need to walk on two legs. We need to walk on the leg that says, how do we help people to understand that being part of the struggle is where the action is. And also how do we continue to build structures within the westernized university structure? I mean, when I say that, what I mean concretely is creating the decolonial research collaborative is building a structure within a westernized structure. It's, it's doing things like that. It's engaging like that, that I think cuts a pathway out of where we are toward the future that we need. If I could just add like a something to that. Um, Go ahead. Robin Kelly's work on the black radical imagination, I think is really, really important. And the, and the way he kind of traces what he terms kind of freedom dreams, the in and through the struggle, right? As a, as a very, as a, almost something that emerges kind of dialectically out of the violence experienced on a visceral daily level. You have actually these utopian traces and glimpses and dreams and longings that are there kind of expressed inchoately but it's kind of like the negative isn't always necessarily just a pure negative that there are positive or the, there are possibilities that are openings that emerge out of that and kind of the role of education or the role of kind of radical educational critical pedagogy should be to try and understand really deeply those experiences and try and tease out um, those those possibilities for for other you know for living other and, and being other and relating other. Um, so yeah, I completely agree. I think Robin Kelly's work is really important. I'd just like to thank you both very much. I'd love to hear what Heather has to say about it as well, and I, I'm I'm looking for forward to other. Um, I, I'm really grateful for the platform. Um, to to ask the question and to to learn so much, um, the what what you, your replies you put in my head was also I was talking to a brilliant woman called Yulia Nestrova who's at Glasgow Uni, and who does is very interested in peace studies, and she was talking about working with a colleague in Sudan, and how young people there had taken to start painting. Uh, you know, whatever surface that they could get, you know, it kind of graffiti, but it was more about the imagination of a peaceful, a peaceful country, a peaceful existence, and the importance of and the emancipatory power of those young people being able to be connected to the imagination, the social imagination of a, a kind of peaceful environment, which I've, I just found really profound, um, I, I, and this decentering of our context, especially as as this has been put within the environmental, the, the, you know, the poly crisis as we you're going to hear it called now, but that kind of acceptance that we're in climate breakdown, not climate change. Uh, you know, to even start use the appropriate language <laughs> to describe that. But then uh, I was reading something. You know, someone pointed out what we call indigenous people. That's a colonial phrase. They were just people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's all all these kind of things. That even and that's again what the gesturing towards the colonial futures. It's, it talks about how the solutions become the problems, and how often you know the the, the, the kind of language of oh yes we're we're doing this, and there's a we I think it's I'm trying to remember who who's funding it. There's work on social imagination which is going on at the moment, which might be of relevance to what we're talking about if you're not aware. But maybe I can. I can get an email or share that kind of information afterwards. It would be great. Thank you very much. Really appreciate having the space to contribute. Thank you so much for that, Mark. Um, indeed, we will be uh, circulating. Uh, we'll be in touch after this, and we'll, we'll we can share resources and and, and collect um, sort of uh, suggestions in this regard. Um, I see uh, Kathy has her hand up. Go ahead, Kathy. Hello. Um, yeah, I just want to echo what Mark was saying. Like, thank you so much. That that 
that really lifted my spirits and it was and it was uh, whilst not always easy topics really great to hear thank you and I also just wanted to say so um I am from the um, Political Studies Association Teaching and Learning Network so I'm one of three people that run that network um and Heather and I had a conversation and then we said we would do it collaboratively and then Heather has basically just run with it and done it so like huge thanks to Heather for doing that I think it's been brilliant and it's so nice to see so many so many people here um so I had a couple of questions and then a, a thought sort of following on from what Mark was saying so your, your your thoughts about doing this work um outside of the university I think is really well taken and really interesting um quite often when we have teaching and learning network events it's all about the kind of the top tips of you know what you should do in your classroom and how do you get the quiet students to talk and you know all that sort of quite technocratic stuff which is why I was really yearning for an event like this where we talk a bit more theoretically um, at a sort of slightly meta level about what we think we're doing um, as teachers in in the world that we live in and with the future that we're thinking about that our students will will live in um but I don't I can't give up on the classroom as this space where you can do this stuff right where you do have some time where you can build relationships with other individual humans who happen to be your students um, where you can have conversations about what the future might look like, what hope might look like, where you can have that kind of that space that you were describing, Darren, to get from, oh, I'd like a lie in to people don't listen to what I need, but maybe we could live in a world where they where they did. Um, and so I wonder if you have anything to say, firstly, about like what we can do in our classrooms or, or whether we need to give up on that hope because it's actually too small scale and too conservative. And then I had a question about critical consciousness, and this comes from a place of, I am a vice dean. Um, and in my role as a vice dean, um, I am trying in all sorts of little ways to make the university a bit more human and a bit more livable for our students and for our colleagues. And I've just had a summer where I've just come up against a lot of brick walls in that endeavor, which I'm not gonna go into in a lot of detail, but it's been a bit dispiriting. Um, and the blocks that I've come up against have all been other academics. Other academics, you know, we can't do this, the students will cheat. Um, you know, a, a whole discourse around, you know, you can't trust students because who knows what will happen and then our rigor and, you know, our, our credentials will, will fall. Um, and, and that really struck me that that is related to this lack of critical consciousness amongst ourselves. Um, and so I'd love to know more about what you think about how we how we build that, how we develop critical consciousness, which is trying to work together with our students instead of this constant discourse of us and them, which makes the universe of the university really difficult to inhabit and, and cuts a lot of people. Um, and then finally, perhaps a little bit with that in mind, I'm so, so happy to see 50 people on this call. I didn't dream that we would have that many. In our um, teaching and learning conversations, we often have more like 10, which is great when you can have great conversations in those groups. But I wonder if maybe other people on the call and also um, Dan and Darren might have any ideas about what we do next, how we keep this conversation going, what you'd like to do. Um, and maybe we can talk about it now or maybe you could contact me and Heather because it seems like there's clearly a hunger for this and, and I would really love to keep this conversation going. Thank you. Uh, Darren, uh, Deanne, any any? Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, happy to start. Um, if if I'll, I'll address the question of what can we do in our classrooms, and um, obviously what, what I wasn't I, what I wasn't saying is that we we should just give up the ghost. <laughs> um, I guess I guess it depends what classrooms you're in. Um, so you know, I used to work in adult education, and it was the best. Um, working years of my life i worked with small groups of 10 to 12 students in three hour sessions every single week they were there because they wanted to come i ran a degree in social and political studies for adult learners they had all made an active decision to come along and their motivation was to try and understand their own experiences in the world it was you could do all of those things that, you know, kind of classic critical pedagogy, um, you know, sort of advises you do. Start from where the students are at, build a curriculum, 
around the students' own experiences, help the students co-create a reading list, assessment criteria, um, actually engage in dialogue, build, build, break down hierarchical relationships between student and, and teacher, all of these things. Now I teach undergraduate and I teach in massive classes that are on a mass production, mass fact, mass production scale. Um, at the end of a 12 week module, I know the names of maybe, you know, a fifth of the students in the class. I don't have chance to talk to them all individually. I have no chance whatsoever of knowing where they come from, their own experiences. We're required by the university and, you know, you should you will know this um, very well. You know, you have to specify everything in advance. The learning outcomes have to be specified in advance. The reading list has to be uploaded well in advance. The assessment has to be well in advance. There's no scope for, or well, very little scope for actual student co-construction of the curriculum, the assessment or anything. So, so I do see the possibilities um, for um, building relationships and, um, and kind of establishing the relations of kind of closeness, presence, trust and care that I think are essential for any kind of genuine critical pedagogy. So I'm not saying giving up the ghost, but I'm, I'm, I, I would... I would definitely point to and, and highlight the, the the constraints. Um, I, I, Diane, do you want to say something about the critical consciousness thing? Because you, you raised that in your, your paper. Sure, but if I can also riff off of what you're saying, Darren. Um, so one of the ideas that I perhaps I didn't articulate it clearly enough, is this idea to actually do away with disciplines, Kathy? I think it's a radical move, but I think if rather than saying, let's continue to induct students into disciplines, rather than doing that, if we start with that the world is on fire, the world is in crisis, then let's just have problem posing. At the adult education level, um, what would happen is that transdisciplinarity would become normalized instead of it being an exception. Um, so, so that's a combined idea of pro have problem posing education and do away with disciplines. Um, I know you were asking about what can be done inside the classroom, but the classroom of course is always linked with the system it's in. And I would actually replace hierarchical management, which we have in the academy with community governance this isn't um, a crazy dream. I taught at Antioch College, um, an old liberal arts radical college in Ohio. We had community govern governance once a week. Everybody got together for an hour. Um, students were actually on the board of governors. Students actually got together in groups. And when they had an issue with something, they actually proposed an, an example. For example, many years ago in the US um, before, um, consent became something meaningful on Antioch campuses, um, people, women um, decided that they had had enough of the exploit, sexual exploitation, um, the rape, et cetera, et cetera. And they said that either we give you consent or we don't. And that became, that rippled across America. But that was a student group who was in an ambience and environment um, and I talk about decolonial atmospheres because they're so important because they give people permission to actually do the utopic dreaming. They give people the permission to stop being this westernized disciplined subject who can only think in particular ways. So the culture on university campuses is in tight relationship with what happens in the classroom and the culture would have to be changed. Um, I think academics have a responsibility for committed to this to learn how to do critical pedagogy. I think people have a really skinny understanding of it. People don't really want to study Paulo Freire after all. You know, he comes from Brazil. He looks like a brown man. What really could we learn from him and other people like Bell Hooks, um, Giro, etc.? Um, but there's another thing, which is that the liberal arts model needs to be um, normalized. Again, tagging to what Darren was just saying, liberal at Antioch College, maximum 20 people in a room. By the second week, everybody knew everybody and we were talking, we were making eye contact. Students would laugh at you if you came in and lectured. 
because that would be dumbing it down. So we pre-read everybody. We grappled with naughty texts that colleagues of mine wouldn't even dare read. But we did it because we knew we had something to learn from people who had theorized and conceptualized about the problems so that we didn't assume from a position of hubris that we were about to solve the world's problems. We had stuff to learn. There was a role for education, but we needed to do it differently. And so what happens in occupied classrooms is drastically different from what happens in a lecture theater where people are not able to engage with each other to explain these gnarly issues of how we understand race, racism, class, et cetera, et cetera. We don't talk about these things. And these are the things that actually structure our lives. You talk about abstract things. So classic Franz Fanon, we need to de-alienate ourselves within the classroom. We need to get closer to what we're actually living through in the classroom and make teaching and learning relevant. Thank you. Amazing answers. Um, I, I, one, one thing that occurs to me is that although you have to plan everything in advance and there are all these rules and regulations in the university, there are sneaky ways around it. Um, and maybe I can do a session on that one day. But um, for example, if you call an assessment a portfolio, you can do whatever you like. <laughs> so, you know, we can be we can go undercover sometimes. But yeah, I mean, there are bigger issues there. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Deanne and, and, and Kathy. Um, uh, Indrajit, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm Indrajit. I'm uh, along with Heather and Kathy. I've had the sort of privilege of being involved in organizing this. I co-convened the Development Politics uh, Specialist Group uh, within the PSA, and I couldn't agree more, Deanne. Uh, you know the the pitfalls of disciplinary thinking and. Uh, development studies emerged uh, out of this separation of disciplines, isn't it? Um, where you had politics and sociology and economics for the, the the core, the core countries and development studies for everybody, you know, out there. So um, I, I do I do think that um, the the point about um, breaking down those disciplinary silos is is absolutely crucial. Um, and that is, in fact, the way in which the majority world goes about, uh, you know, studying and uh, teaching. That is, these hard line uh, distinctions between politics and sociology are, uh, you know, they're not really taken so seriously elsewhere in the world. Um, so I, I think there's there's a lot to learn there. Uh, in terms of uh, breaking down those 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 uh, those silos, uh, and uh, that doesn't mean that everything is everything, obviously. But you know, you you can sort of have themes, and you can have uh, topics that uh, you, you, we can sort of work on. So I think that that's that's a really heartening uh, point that you make, um, and I, I wish we we could you know say more and do more about uh, really going past these disciplinary uh, boundaries. Um, my uh, question generally was, and to both of you, uh, you know, as somebody, uh, I, I study hope, um, and I've always drawn a distinction between hope and utopia, and I, and it's probably a forced distinction, but uh, I've, I've sort of steered away from utopia, uh, I think, because of the worry that, and, and, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, uh, it might just be in my head, really. But, uh, you know, the, the idea of utopia suggests a view of how you want the world to be, uh, whereas hope seems to me to be sort of more playful, more incremental, full of compromises, politics, and I might just be all wrong about it. Um, but I, 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 I wanted to provoke you a bit to think about the role of compromises, the role of being realistic. And I take the point you make, Darren, about how our ideas of what is possible and what is realistic is itself constrained by the dominant structures, of course. Um, but there is a point beyond which, you know, you might be considered delusional. And I'm not suggesting that the paras you re read were delusional, not at all. But, you know, there, there is, the, there is the, the, the hopelessness that comes about if you think about a future that is just so difficult to reach, but 
you know, in the meantime, there are lots of things that can be done. So anyway, my my question generally to to you both is how do you how, how do you deal with the reality of 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 you know people having to strike compromises uh, of uh, the reality of uh, our knowledge and our practice being necessarily incomplete, uh, whereas uh, you know the idea of utopia sometimes suggests that we know everything there is, and I'm not, I'm I'm not saying that you were suggesting that, but that's you know usually associated with the sorts of utopias that we've come across, whether it's the free market utopia or the socialist utopia, they 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 did uh, it enforce a certain sort of all knowability uh, or the colonial utopias for that matter. Co uh, the colonize the colonizing powers insisted that they had the the full solution to the problems of the of the people they were colonizing, isn't it? Um, and that was the civilizational project that they were imposing upon uh, the global South. So um, it, it's it, it's a rambling set of thoughts, but I, I thought what better way to approach this question on incompleteness than with a rambling set of thoughts. But thank you so much. This has been fantastic uh, from our point of view. Thank you. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Andrew. So, so about half of my research outputs concern the relationship between hope and utopia. So I could actually talk for about 20 hours in response to your, your question. <laughs> I'm not going to speak for 20 hours. Um, so so, so my, my, my basic take on hope is that it's not a singular, undifferentiated experience, right? So different individuals, different social classes, different circumstances, different contexts experience hope differently, right? So, so I, I kind of have a, a materialist reading of, of hope. That hope is materially grounded and, and is experienced differentially. So I've written stuff about there being different modes of hoping. And some of those modes are not at all utopian. They are far more pragmatic. They are based around a sound assessment of the evidence about whether a goal is appropriate to be hoped for or not. Um, some are actually anti-utopian, some forms of, of hope that are placed in the kind of um, the beneficence of the beneficence of a of a of a divine other can be anti-utopian in the sense of um very other directed um what I what I term kind of um a sort of patient hope that hopes that things will be well um in spite of everything around but there are other hopes so, so so there are other hopes that are utopian that are collective collaborative hopes that are targeted or, or the objective of hope is a socially elaborated guiding vision towards which action can be um undertaken so how so hope has different modes and experience differently in different contexts by different peoples and your notion of utopia i kind of agree with and disagree with so I agree that that the characteristics of utopia you've described um, are appropriate, Char do characterize certain utopias and certain kind of um, uh, kind of individual um, utopias and, and the kind of whole range of Renaissance utopian texts fall foul of, of what you've characterized, which is why I focus on trying to work towards and try and understand what it would take to make possible a grassroots bottom-up elaborated collective utopian vision so when i talk about utopianism and arguing for utopianism and being a political utopian i'm not saying that what we need is some kind of privileged bourgeois individual to to paint for us a picture of the world that we need and you know kind of and rally everyone around I'm saying what we need is actually a collective, a co it's part of a collective struggle, a, a, a utopian vision of where we're going emerges through the very process of getting there, right? We make the road by walking, as Paolo Freire and, and Miles Horton, kind of the title of one of their famous dialogue books, that the road we're travelling for, that the utopia we're striving for is made during the course of the struggle for it so it's kind of like a dialectical iterative grassroots utopia building so the kind of utopia i'm arguing for is different from the kind of utopia that you rightly characterize and rightly critique um 
Yeah, so sorry, sorry, I was kind of that was a bit garbled because I was trying to shove a, a whole ton of stuff into five minutes, but I'll, I'll end it there. Thank you, Darren, so much for that. Um, I don't know if if Deanne had anything to add on, on this point before we go to our next uh, participant. Have a couple of thoughts. Um, for me, having studied and believing in liberation psychology, there's no hope in indifference. There's no hope in bystanding. There's no hope in wishful thinking. And there is hope in struggle. And I know from being in community with people that when people are struggling against these forces, that there's a, that, that hope emerges. So I think that's an important distinction. And I think hope is one of those affective things that, um, or its lack as well, is one of those things that NASA Mayor is speaking about in the cruel optimism of um, racial justice. And then the role of compromises is such an intriguing question. And I think, so for me, compromise, when we are faced in these deeply unjust situations, compromises that take us forward can actually be dialogic, are actually part of the dialogue that is ongoing in order to bring about a world in a nonviolent way. Um, because as we know, a nonviolent approach is going to be the, a long approach. So I think that compromises within the context of historical movement forward is a distinctly different thing than capitulation. And I think um, your question deserves a tremendous amount of space and time um, for us to do some collective thinking on it. Thank you so much, Deanne. Um, I'm just conscious of time. So we've got about eight minutes and we have two hands. Um, so yes, I think we'll maybe, we'll see how we go, but final two questions. So um, I think Phil was first and then we'll go on to Teresa. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I think there's a lot of really interesting stuff here. One of, one of the things that I'm particularly interested in, because I'm, I'm actually from a natural sciences background originally. And I think it sort of, um, I, I completely agree with a lot of the problems of, of scientism, but I, I just wonder whether or not we should see science being a method in what people think is structure. And I was just wondering if anybody's come across or anybody's done any work with the London Interdisciplinary School, because they, they are a fantastic way of showing how we can begin to take a very different, be almost beyond transdisciplinary approach. Hello. <laughs> yes, um, thank you for, I think some parts of that um, did, did, um, uh... Yeah, did that come through okay or to Deanne and Darren? I'm sorry, I feel, because I think you cut out there a bit. Could you just quickly rephrase your question? Uh, repeat your yeah, question. Yeah, it, it, it's just whether or not, um, I, I really like the model of the London Interdisciplinary School where they use science, but they use science alongside a whole series of other ways of thinking about really important, really difficult problems. And I just wonder whether or not that's a, another really fantastic potential model. I've never heard of them, Phil, um, and I'm really glad to learn about them and I, I want to see what they're doing. Yeah, thank you so much, Phil. Um, I've added it to the list of notes um, for circulation for the conversation afterwards, thank you. Um, I, we had a hand up from Teresa. I don't know if she's still with us. Um, Teresa, are you? Yes, uh, yes, I am. Can you see me? Yeah, yes. Or hear me? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, it's really hot here. So I, I hope I can explain myself in a few minutes. Um, so I am a, an academic as well, but um, I'm also a bit fed up with it. So I've left uh, and now I'm based in Morocco and developing um pedagogical models based on transformative education that are based on my own research in the classroom. So what happened is that I taught in Italy and then Sweden about migration and 
inclusion, which is my topic. And so I, my old question was, how do I teach as being white myself? My students, for instance, about racism, which is a topic of my research that was also revealed to me by interviewing immigrants in my own country and so on, right? And so that's what I found. I was teaching in a department of critical sociology, a gender department in Lund. And I would go to my colleagues and ask, do you have uh, guides to tell me how I can teach these things? And the only thing was bell hooks, uh, teaching to transgress. I so do we have a methodology to teach this? How am I gonna do this? So basically based on that, I did develop my own methodology because I did not have it, any other choice, which I'm writing about and I can also share about. But what is that I came out with this last article that I wrote is I'm convinced that we need a paradigm shift in education in terms of moving from student oriented, which is very much used in, for instance, in the UK or North America, but not really in Italy or France or even Morocco, where we are basically teaching still with the teacher being basically God. <laughs> and so even in the student oriented approach, we have many ele elements to move beyond oppressive teaching and be more inclusive. But still, this is not transformative education. So my question is to you. First of all, how do you teach in the classroom this crit with through critical pedagogy? Are you using a student-oriented approach and then infusing it with transformative elements? Or are you really also into this para new paradigm, which I feel in many people, for instance, in Canada, we wrote a book on this with indigenous people and other colleagues coming from very diverse groups. And to me, reading at the chapters, I felt like, oh, maybe we are already moving into this third paradigm, but no one is naming it this way in terms of really moving to like more bottom-up approach rather than horizontal. For instance, Darren described that before as really co-constructed the whole curriculum with the student when possible. So I really have this question to you and even in an email, if someone can tell me if there is any department in the world that is really using this new paradigm and that we can learn from what they are doing. Is it clear? Okay, I hope so. So, Teresa, um, not sure if you've ever heard of Unitiera, the University of the Earth. Yeah. In Oaxaca. In Oaxaca, that's based on Paula Freire's um, work and Gustava Esteva, and, and they created this extraordinary um, adult education opportunity. People bring problems to it. They get from all over Mexico. If an architect is needed to come in and teach somebody something, they find the person to come. If they need um, a biologist, they bring that person. So it's um, very much, and actually UNESCO has awarded it with some, you know, kind of stamp or seal of approval for what that's worth. But when you mention third paradigm, there are examples of third paradigms. They are happening, but um, I don't think they can happen in the westernized university on a large scale. They can happen in these pockets, as we know. Um, but if you start to cause too much trouble and if you start to say, well, let's have a complete department um, <laughs> only using third paradigm or utopian or um, crit truly critical and decolonial approaches, um, it probably wouldn't go very far. But 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 yes, and I would encourage you to look at what Unity Era does, for example, and Gustavus so and Prakash. Um, I'm blanking on Prakash's name. It'll come back to me. Yeah, I could write you an email if it's possible, and you can. Thanks. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, just try to. Um... What the answer said, I mean, if a university, if a whole university or even a university department genuinely embodied and enacted critical pedagogy, then the university would no longer be the university or the department <laughs> would get closed down. Um, I mean, obviously, there are examples, you know, there are kind of edited collections out there of kind of drawing together kind of, some kind of in individuals or individual programs that have tried to um enact things and, and i'm happy to kind of send you a sort of list of, of books edited collections of kind of critical pedagogy enacted here and there but they do tend to be sort of one-off kind of experiments within um a kind of neoliberal 
Academy, um, which is part and parcel of, you know, kind of my argument about the difficulties of genuinely embodying a kind of critical utopian pedagogy within formal institutions. The individual examples, individual instances are tolerated and actually can even be recuperated and sold. Yes. Right. So, so um, the example of, say, a student as producer at the University of Lincoln, Mike Neary, a revolutionary Marxist, became, you know, kind of um, faculty, dean of teaching and learning within a university and tried to roll out an entire university wide reconceptualization of kind of student um, and management um, relationships and student and teacher relationships. But that was completely um, recuperated by his own admission. It just wasn't possible given the managerial logics of the, of the neoliberal academy. So there are individual instances, and, you know, sort of Diana's just pointed to one, around that you can point to, but, you know, imagining that being rolled out whole scale <laughs> across uh, Western institutions is, is, is very difficult to imagine. Uh, Diane, Diane, you're muted. <laughs> I just want to share this, since we don't have a chat, Escaping Education by Maru Prakash and Gustavo Esteva, learning, uh, living as learning with grassroots cultures. Um, Can you put it in the camera? Yeah, thanks. Thank you um, so much. Um, and uh, we are out of time. And uh, I, honestly, this has been so, so inspiring. And um, and just as a reminder that, you know, to, to you know, despite the challenges, do we have to keep fighting and nurturing these spaces? Because that's all we have. I mean, you know, the, the future is not written. It gets, the, it's, the fight is far from over and uh, keep at it. Um, and you are not alone in any of this. Um, uh, thank you again uh, to our, our two speakers, Darren and Deanne, and to, to everyone else for your fantastic questions and for being here on, on, a, on an afternoon and when you could have been doing loads of other things. And, uh, and thank you so much. Um, I We will be circulating the recording um, just for, you know, for anybody and particularly for, for some of our colleagues who couldn't be here. Uh, but yeah, and do keep an eye out for emails. We can continue this conversation um, afterwards. Um, yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Yeah, if I can just reiterate that, thank you so much for, for coming along and for your, for your questions. I appreciate that this is an absolutely crazy busy time of year when you know every hour and a half is absolutely precious so thank you so much for spending that with us thank you i joined darren with that thank you very much it's incredible to have people engage with these ideas absolutely very well said thank you everybody